And welcome back to the Livingston Parish News Weekly Show, a podcast brought to you by the Livingston Parish News. My name is McHugh David, publisher and editor of the news. And today we are joined by a gentleman. We're going to be talking about what he's busy with, but he is a very busy man. Uh, and I'm going to let him introduce himself real quick. And that should explain why he's so busy at the moment. Uh, good afternoon, McHugh. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, I'm, I'm Buddy Mincy. State Rep from District 71, which is in the Denham Springs and the Walker areas. We are in the middle of session right now, uh, but I have an opportunity to come by and talk to you about some pending legislation that I have. Right, because uh, thankfully, you know, as a as we'll talk about later too, you were at a 4-H Achievement Day this morning, uh, handing out awards and having fun with those kids. That's always a high energy event. But to the first podcast we're doing, which comes out on Monday morning, we're talking about your legislative schedule for the year. And, uh, boy, it's a busy one. It is. It's a busy one. And, um, you know, I, some of the, you know, some of the bills may seem simple in nature, but they're really complicated. And that's what the legislative process is. And we're trying to vet through those things. But um, I'm real proud of the, the legislation that I got proposed. Well, yes, sir. So let's dig into it. This is going to be, uh, I don't want to say we're just going to fly through it, but we got to keep a steady clip because yep. you've got plenty going on. First and foremost, let's talk about HB 244, uh, which is relative to public school calendar requirements. Now, you know, when you're talking about an abstract of a bill, it just says what it's relative to. Uh, for this particular one, I believe you're going to be trying to give local districts a little more control over their school calendar, correct? Yeah, that's correct. C currently, you know, we have a requirement. They give us a certain amount of number of minutes, and we make the calendar as a local system. We make the calendar accordingly. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the advantages of a year-round calendar and, you know, looking into legislation or existing what was existing. You know, some people would argue that, you know, the locals can only do set their calendars. Um, I didn't think for the year-long calendar that, that that was clear enough. And so we have a bill, HB 244, just basically establishes local autonomy that if, uh, if, a, if a system is going to have a year-long calendar, it will be determined by that system and not by Bessie or not by LDOE. You know, I, I, I don't think as I don't think that, you know, what works for Red River works for Bozier, works for Jefferson, works for Livingston Parish. And I don't think anybody knows those communities better than the locals. And when you start considering uh, a year long calendar and how that impacts the community, the parents and all those things, um, it needs to be a local decision. So um, my bill just clarify some things and just basically says if you're going to have a year-long calendar, the calendar is going to be determined by the local. Sure. And there are uh, benefits and negatives to it, uh, just like anything else. That's correct. Uh, but I know a big argument, especially from teachers and administrators, is uh, information retention when these kids get off for almost three months over the summer. It's just very hard to reboot the next year. Yeah, you know, it, it, there's a reboot when we get off for the, for the, for the Christmas break, too. You sure. Know? So, um, I, you know, there's 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 documentation or data that supports that is, is, is positive for a year-long calendar. But again, regardless of what that says, the local communities should be the ones that are making um, those decisions. Sure. So uh, so that's what my, my, per my, my, my legislation just establishes that. Gotcha. So getting into the next series, uh, we're first going to take a step back one year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had a pretty full slate last year as well. Uh, thankfully, uh, it doesn't look like you're going to have any COVID legislation this year. But I want to talk about um, House Resolution 194, which was from last year. So just give us a brief overview because your next four bills are going to kind of stem from that. Yeah. So, you know, what we did, um, there was a, a concern brought up to me uh, from a parent about, you know, checking out a kid from school. And, um, and you know, they thought it was too easy. Um, there wasn't enough guardrails in place. So, you know, I, you know, I checked into it a little bit and found that, you know, school systems do different things. Some school s systems have a, a, a policy for the whole parish, um, and some of them allow each individual school to, to, to do their own, to establish what their, their policy would be. So, you know, it, uh, you know, thinking that there was an opportunity for that to be improved, we, we passed a resolution last year, a study resolution, and um, we asked LSBA to go and, um, and review, you know, look, at, look across the state and come up with some suggestions and some recommendations. And, um, and that's what they did. So I have three bills that are coming uh, this year as a result of that. And the first one is, uh, is this 245. And, um, and what that one does, as simplistic as it may be, there was a situation where a kid was, was, was taken into custody uh, by a state agency. 
and um and you know and they had their own kid and um so you know spelling of the name was was different from another kid on campus so all you know one of the recommendations come out of the re the study resolution is that we uh we simply just establish who that kid is you know we've got a name we've got a birthday we've got an address and then you know there's a policy the policy will be in place that the school system verifies that so that's that's really all that 245 does is just make sure that we have the proper identification Gotcha. So going into uh, Nexus 263, uh, and this one, again, seems simple, but maybe it's there's just not a uniform checkout procedure, I'm guessing. That, that's correct. And, you know, kind of kind of going back to what we talked about with the year-long scout calendar, you know, it's hard to come in. I think too many times policymakers come in and they think they've got the fix, but they don't know all the interactions of different systems. So it, it would even be hard for me to come in and say, even though I may have some thoughts on what the proper checkout procedure would be, you know, I, again, I'm, you know, what works in Livingston Parish may not work somewhere else. So all this bill does is, uh, is requires each school system to develop a policy. And if, um, and if that policy is that, that they have a, a parish-wide policy, then that's fine. Review it every three years and, uh, and continue and make adjustments as you need. Um, if it's not that it's, that it allows each each school to do what they think is best, then at least there's going to be some oversight. So you know that individual school in that case would submit their policy to the superintendent or his designee. They would review it and they review them every three years. So it's just really just a uh, a little bit of a checks and balance and um, a little bit of an oversight and it's something that's really important for the safety of our kids. Sure. And actually, I, I think it was only three that stem from that, but this one seems very important. It looks like it's going to go before the Criminal Justice Committee. Uh, but this, uh, an unauthorized checkout of a child, uh, you're looking for punitive measures for that. You know, this is, uh, this is one of those ones that seems really easy, but it's really complicated. And, um, you know, the, the suggestion came back, the recommendation came back, that there's, there are statutes that are existing already um, in the kidnapping statutes that, that you could arguably, you know, use, you know, when you're trying to press charges and so forth. But what happens too much with law enforcement is that, you know, they don't want to go through and charge, especially with custodial issues. You know, you know there, there may not necessarily be uh, significant enough to have kidnapping charges and that all, everything is associated with that. So it was recommended that we have a, um, a, a, a create a crime of unauthorized removal of a minor, and it includes the schools and it includes the daycares. Um, but that's really, really complicated in, in today's society and with the custodial issues that we have. So we're really trying to put some guardrails in there to prevent parents from using it against other parents. Um, we want to we want to have it as another tool in a, in a toolbox for law enforcement. Um, but you know, there's a there's an implementation issue on their end as well. So we're, we're working through that. The, the the legislative process is working. We're vetting that and we're trying to improve it. And um and but hopefully at the end of it we have um something that this is beneficial. Sure. Getting into something a little different, uh, HB four twenty three. You're trying to, um, <clears throat> I guess you can say you're not forcing high school seniors to register to vote, but you want to make it easier for them. Exactly. So, whenever I I went to school, I mean I I think we all register to vote every year. Uh, there was a free enterprise class or a civics class, whatever it was that we we registered, and um and now you know those same classes are being offered sometimes to eighth graders, you know, and mm -hmm. so the you know we have so many opportunities for our kids, and our kids are are taking advanced classes at an earlier age, so it's really it's just all over the spectrum, and um whenever I ran for uh, the state rep. I noticed a tremendous amount of kids that I knew that were not registered. You know, I had three daughters that went through high schools two years apart. So 10 years or so, I had a kid in high school every year. So when, when we were registering uh, or we were, you know, campaigning and stuff, I saw, I saw a, a, you know, a gap where there's a lot of kids that were being, um, they were not registered. And, uh, you know, we're a good, good civic-minded community. And, and um, you know, I, I started saying, well, what can we do to fix that? So I asked our legislators, I mean, our uh, administrators, um, you know, curriculum administrators at the school system, I said, if, if I wanted to target one class that we could give kids an opportunity, what would it be? You know, I'm anticipating, a, you know, some kind of American history class, just something along those lines. And they came back because of all the different variations. They said English 4 was the best 
probably the best class to have. And I don't really think it's, a, a, you know, appropriate to offer it there. Um, and again, it's hard for me to come and tell, you know, all these school systems throughout the state how you're going to do this. But all this bill does is it gets them to, re, uh, to set up a policy to where they give kids an opportunity. They can either enroll on the computer um, or they can do it the old hard, you know, hard cart, uh, the, the handwritten way. Um, and this is targets our seniors. And it just requires each school system to develop a policy and they can decide what that may be. You know, it could be uh, when a senior, you know, uh, when they got an exit, when they're, they're getting ready to get out of school, it could be at an um, open house however it may be, but the school system decide, and we just want them to give those kids an opportunity. Sure. So staying uh, staying in the education realm, HB 455, uh, this one's interesting. This is with regard to non-public schools, correct? Mm-hmm. This is about, uh, uh, you know, when you're entering, especially the public school system, there's a minimum requirement of education that's required. Correct. Uh, this seems to be for certain non-public schools, uh, you're looking to change those minimum qualifications. How so? So in you know, I we have we have one, I guess one non-public school in our parish, K to twelve, and that's Open Door Baptist Church, and um, they've got a great program. Uh, their pastor came to me with an issue and asked me to help him try to solve it. Uh, right now, as a non-public, in order for them to to maintain their accreditation, they have to hire teachers who who come from a regionally accredited university, and that limits them a little bit. Um, they would like to be able to use uh, nationally accredited, um, you know, they want to be able to hire teachers who come from a nationally accredited university. And, um, you know, it just gives them some more options, you know, and so I, I checked with the LDOE to see, you know, how this actually would impact. And, you know, they, they informed me that the public schools have been doing this for several years already. It just looks like the non-publics were left out of it. So uh, we're going to change that. We're going to allow them to hire teachers who are nationally accredited. And um and are we going to try to change that? And that's just going to give them um, more options. Sure. This one's interesting. HB four seventy one. It's going to go before the criminal justice committee. Provides relative to background checks for workers dressed in costume. Yes. Now, what's that all about? So, uh, well, I think they're all interesting. Uh, well, that was sure. Yes. Um, sure, sure, sure. But you know, so. You know, I had, you know, an individual in the parish who, who uh, participates during the Christmas season and um, he, you know, dresses up as Santa Claus and does different things. And uh, he came to me and said, hey, you know, we have an issue. And that issue is there's no background checks for, you know, people like myself who are dressed up in costume. And after looking into it, he was right. There is no background checks. And um Unfortunately, in today's society, we have to do everything we can to protect our kids. So, um, you know, we're, this is this piece of legislation is just going to require, um, you know, a background check. And um, but it's, it's, it's complicated. And uh, we're trying to work out the issues to where we're not, you know, drastically impacting our small businesses um, and at the same time trying to protect our kids. So this is one, again, that's going through the legislative process when I first presented it in criminal justice. Uh, all the attorneys had their 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 day with me, and uh, bringing up all the different scenarios. And um, well, no, actually, I haven't done that with this one yet. It was another one. Well, I anticipate the same thing with this one. Um, but that's all it does. It's just to uh, just to protect our kids. Gotcha. And we know that we have a lot of costume theme parties around Livingston Parish. Uh, so I mean, I, I, that hits home. Yeah, and just just to just to clarify too, it's going to be it's going to look if you're doing this at home. Uncle Bob's coming over or something like that. It's only whenever there's someone getting employed, um, you know, getting paid to do something, and they're having a you know significant imp- and you know interference interaction with the kids. Sure. So getting into this next one, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, you know, last year when you came to talk to me pre-session, big, big, big subject the whole time was teachers and everything from the availability of them to payment to, you know, how they get educated and that kind of thing. So I think we're about to dive into that. Let's back up a year uh, to revise statute. It, it, this is a Resolution 126 through the Louisiana Department of Education. So give us a little bit of background on that. Yeah, I'm trying to, um, I got to figure out which one that was, um, if you, this is, oh, this is, um, this is the teacher training, right? Yes. Yes. All right. So, you know, I actually brought the uh the, the the training with me uh just just for an example but 
you know, we have so much requirements on our teachers. And, um, you know, you know, again, you know, there's so many things that, that, are, that are frustrating for them that they just can't go out and, be, and, and educate our kids. They've got all this stuff that policyholders or policymakers are, are making them do. And, and one of them is training. Um, we have so many requirements of training on our teachers, and they're doing it on their own time. And so, you know, I, I passed a resolution to make LDOE, to have LDOE uh, go and, and, and evaluate what that looks like. And you know, try to capture all those different training requirements, and then come up with some suggestions for us on how we can make some um, you know adjustments to it. You know, for bullying, for instance, you know, we got four year four hours of training for our new teachers and two hours of training every year thereafter. And um, I, I think you know some of those things. I mean, if if you look at it, and there's there's three pages of you know just you know one after another of training that we're requiring our teachers to do. And, and they're doing it on their own time. And um, so, you know, I'd asked LDOE to identify them and give recommendations. They came back and said, you know, hey, we had a hard time putting this together. It was all over the place. So we need a centralized database. And also we need, um, you know, they recommended that the legislator and Bessie get together and, and, and do that vetting process. So, you know, this bill 509 just basically turns that back around on them you know, ask LDOE to establish that database to where it's not so cumbersome to locate and find and to give us, have them work with Bessie and give us our recommendations on what we can do to minimize, combine, or, or whatever it is on the training. Sure. And what about 510? So 510, um, you know, this one's, this one's, this one's kind of interesting, uh, as you would say. Yeah. Um, you know, it basically, you know, says enough's enough. When it comes to our training, I mean, you know, we've got 12, 14 hours a year of training of our teachers on their own time. Um, and most of this is coming from legislators. So this basically just says, you know, in order to have future training, either you find a funding source, you you fund that source in, in that training time, or you remove something that's existing. So it's just a, a cry of, of saying, hey, enough's enough. Uh, let's stop dropping all this, teacher, this training on our teachers. Gotcha. So moving on, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, a concurrent resolution from last year, number 39. This was a, a task force mm -hmm. in regard to the Louisiana Department of Education. So again, we got a couple of sub bills this year that stem from that. Tell us a little bit about the task force. The, the task force, you know, again, you know, when, I, when we talked about it before, you know, I've, I've seen the, the trending on, you know, our, our workforce for our teachers. I've seen it declining drastically. You know, I've seen, you know, parents who have kids who want to be teachers and the, and the parents who are teachers telling them, don't, don't do this. You know, we've got, we've got kids going to residency programs and, and they go, when they go into our schools to complete their residency programs, teachers are telling them, don't, you know, don't do this. Um, when you go to high school or college graduations, you know, we're a third, you know, if not worse of the graduates that we're turning out, you know, at our regionally LSU and Southeastern. Um, and, you know, again, I've used example before job fairs in Livingston Parish. We'd have 10 openings and have a job fair and have 500 applicants show up. Now we're begging people to come in. So the task force was, was a two-year task force. The Board of Regents, Dr. Kim Hunter-Reed, is, is heading it up and staffing it. Um, they were tasked with identifying, you know, what that workforce is, or where, it's, where it's been and where it's going. So they evaluated from a retention, recruitment, and a recovery. And, um, and the idea was it for it to come up with recommendations. Um, so the first years come out. Uh, we've got a whole list of things that they're working on. We've got another year left in the task force, and we're actually going to be traveling around the state and, and meeting with teachers and giving them a voice. We have teachers on the task force. But uh, HB 546, um, what, it, what it does, one thing that was identified in the task force by LDOE, LDOE said that, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a praxis requirement. There's a praxis one and a praxis two. Praxis one you take before you can even enter the educational program. Prax Praxis two is the one you take at the end for your certification to make sure you've got the, the content and all that, and then you can become a certified teacher. But, but we're screening teachers with potential teachers with a standardized test in the very beginning. And, um, and there's no correlation from what you know, DOE says. There's no correlation from passing that test to becoming a good teacher. Uh, a lot of the states around us are getting away with that standardized test requirement up front. And uh, LDOE estimates that it's costing us a 1,000 students a year in Louisiana alone 
who are not even enrolling in the educational program um, because they can't pass that entrance exam. And that entrance exam, I mean, look, you know, you can go, you can become a doctor and you can go enroll in your, your biology program in your four years. You don't have to take an, an entrance exam. You don't, I mean, they're, the only, the only um, profession that requires that is our teachers. So, you know, LDOE came up with the recommendation to do away with that Praxis One requirement, and, um, and that's what this bill does. And, um, and it basically just stipulates that if, you know, as an, as an education applicant, you know, you're going to, a uh, student, you're going to meet the requirements of that university, and you're not going to have to take the standardized test to see if you can even enter that program. Sure. So trying to remove barriers to entry, incentivize it's absolutely, people to get involved. It's absolutely a barrier. It's costing us a thousand, you know, students a, a year. I think the average of taking that is one point eight times. So you know, you're, you're looking at each each person, you know, costing three hundred dollars to take something to even see if they can become, you know, enroll in the program. And I, I personally know of quite a few people who would be phenomenal teachers who can't do it because they couldn't pass that practice one. And um, you know, so um. You know, we're trying to eliminate that barrier, and it, and it ties in with our workforce. And, um, and and we're not just eliminating it because we need teachers. We're eliminating because this barrier is just not working. Sure. So let's uh, – we've got four left here. We're going to hit the cliff okay. a little bit. Uh, first and foremost, um, it, it looks like, uh, well, Mr. Ron Dunham of Lee Shin Brewery kind of approached you uh, about microbrewing, and mm -hmm. you've got something going before the judiciary. I happen to also know Mr. Kerry Koch with Pelican State Partners. So tell us a little bit about what you're looking to change there in the law. Yeah, so Lachin is a microbrewery here in Denham Springs at the Antique District, and, and they just got a phenomenal environment. Uh, they really do, and um, I think we only have 40 or so breweries in the state. Um, they're, they're really stifled, and this is just an opportunity for them to, uh, to, to possibly expand and, and, and grow that industry. And, um, you know, it, it enables them, if they've got two facilities that they own that they're brewing at, they can just move their products back and forth. And it also allows them to do some selling to the wholesalers. Um, and, you know, again, this is a, this is a complicated bill because of uh, all the other, uh, you know, alcoholic in industries and, um, and, you know, our bars and so forth. And we're trying to, uh, to work with them to find something that we can all uh, find, find common ground on. A little general consensus. Yes. I gotcha. um, <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have another bill, but you're uh, you're looking to create a commission here. Uh, uh, this is about school accountability scoring. Mm -hmm. uh, d tell us how you're, or, or maybe you're not looking for any end result. You're just trying to find a better way. You know, we have as a as a state, we have had two recent successes on task force. Our dual enrollment task force, you know, which was was sponsored by uh, Representative Kim Brass and also headed up by by Regents. And um, our, our task force, our teacher task force, where we're, we're studying that recruitment, recovery, and retention, very successful at bringing the stakeholders across the state and, and putting them together and, and trying to find solutions and finding common ground to fix things. Um, right now, accountability has always been a problem um, since accountability has rolled out. It's, it's not, um, you know, and the, the problem for me has just been, um, it's just not equitable. You know, used to be, you know, I, I think at one time, you know, 50 percent of your high school accountability was dictated by ACT score. Well, you know, so we test everybody. It doesn't matter if they're special needs, if they're English speaking. Um, we test everyone. And if you don't score an 18, you get a zero in the high school accountability. Well, you know, statewide, only 19 percent of our students are graduating from college. So there's the majority of our kids are just not going to college, especially in our school system. And they're going to and they're going to fulfill careers. You know, career technical education is real big in our parish, but we give every kid the ACT, and um and we and we hold that school accountable. You can get a 17 and score in the tops, but if you don't score an 18, you get a zero for your accountability for the school. It's just not fair. And um and what what I think again, you know, policymakers have been making these determinations. So right now, you've got a lot of people looking at accountability. Um, you've got Bessie looking at accountability. You've got the Superintendents Association looking at accountability. You've probably got uh, different other groups looking at it. And, and all this does is create a task force to bring them together so we can all talk it through and, um, and try to find common ground and change it, to a, um, change it to a formula that works. Right. Well, <laughs> building consensus, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so we're, we're going to fly through these last two. Uh, 
first, I want you to talk about House Concurrent Resolution 46 with the CPRA from last year. Uh, and then uh, this is basically uh, natural resources and commerce. But let, let's talk about um, 46 from 2021. Yeah, 46, you know, we we had a study resolution to study the Amit River Basin Commission um, and, you know, and, and see if there's any opportunities for us to make that better. Uh, we tasked in the in the study resolution, we got CPRA to head that up for us. It did a really phenomenal job. And came up with a, a, a you know extensive list of things that we can do to better um, the Amit River Basin um, Commission, and um, and we are you know the legislation that we're trying to put forth is um, is to to put all that together. Gotcha. And uh, last but certainly not least, something that has become very important here is emergency preparedness, uh, and this one's talking about propane and fuel. Yes. Uh, wh- where are you going with that? After the Hurricane Ida. You know, I was helping, um, you know, I helped quite a few of my colleagues um, around the state in the recovery after, you know, after my area was, was stabilized. But one thing that we had in a lot of the rural parts of our parish was was getting propane. And, um, you know, everybody, the ones that had generators or the ones that were using, you know, had, you know, had propane for their house use. Um, you know, I guess everybody got, became empty around the same time. And we just had a tremendous amount of uh, difficulty getting those propanes refilled. And, um, you know, it was it was brought up during that time that there were some territorial issues. You know, this company couldn't go across this line or this company couldn't fill this bottle. And, um, you know, we were able to work through those issues. But all this this legislation says is that during an emergency and we added other fuels to it. You know, every fuel we got diesel, gas, we added it, but it was originally intended for propane. But during an emergency, you know, you can't you know, those types of restrictions can't get in the way. Oh, we're trying to to get people back on their feet, trying to help them recover. So, if there's any type of territorial issue beforehand during emergencies, that's relaxed. You know, as long as emergency is declared and we can provide services for our, our folks. Sure. So, again, as as I'm sure you can tell, we've spent 28 minutes going through at, at a pretty steady clip uh, your legislative slate for this year. Uh, we wish you. Uh, it all sounds pretty reasonable. We wish you the best of luck. I know that things have gotten started. Uh, we will be checking in with you after the session. Yes. To see how things went. So, uh, sir, if you'll take a quick second and introduce yourself, we'll head on out. Yes, this is Buddy Mincy, state rep from Denham Springs and Walker, District 71. And uh, it was uh, I had I had fun being with you here today. Yes, sir. We appreciate you taking the time. I want to remind folks that tomorrow on Tuesday, we'll have another podcast where he's going to be talking about some of the tours he's given and some of the community involvement he's had trying to show off our parish. Again, my name is McHugh David, publisher and editor of the news. Appreciate you guys out there joining us. Please remember the news is on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. We're a once a week imprint on Thursdays at $7 a month. Get that in your mailbox. We're also online, www.livingstonparishnews.com. One last time, we appreciate you joining us, and we'll see you next time.